We're covering the 2008 presidential campaign uh, for our magazines, and one day just started talking about the incredible characters, incredible plot, uh, and the incredible opportunity we saw to try to tell the story, maybe in a different way than daily, weekly, monthly journalism allows, to just uh, tell the story from a human point of view about the relationships in politics, about the pressure of running for president. And that first conversation, we laid down our vision of what a book like that would be like, and we executed it, uh, you know, whether people like it or not. We executed <laughs> the book for both Game Change and now for Double Down exactly the way that we discussed it in that first conversation. So uh, when you did the second book uh, versus the first book, did you do some things differently just from the, what you gauged from the reaction? You know, we didn't really. We did, the, the formula was very much the same, you know, and we did this, this book um, we took place over three years of reporting and writing as opposed to the last book, which took place over about a year and a half. So we did a lot more interviews. We did 500 and some interviews with 400 and some people for this book. But the general uh, approach to it has been has pretty much been the same. Focus on the high human drama. Do a lot of long, detailed interviews with a lot of people. Uh, try to think about this as not being a political story, but just a story about really exceptional people and a really intense competition at the pinnacle of American life. How do you guys handle, because you're both journalists and you both do real-time reporting as well, how do you juggle the off-the-record conversations that you get for the long-form stuff that you do with the uh, on-the-record conversations when you know you're sitting on a bunch of secrets because you're waiting to publish them? Right. Well, a lot of the, almost uh, the majority of the interviews we do for the book are done after the election. And all the interviews we do are on deep background. People are promised not just confidentiality about their identities, but also that the material will only be for the book. And they know the book's not going to come out until well after Election Day. So it's it's not as much of a struggle as, as some people think, just because uh, we're clear with the sources what it's for. The stories develop over time. So it's not like uh, we're sitting on a bunch of stuff that uh, we're itching to report. We're, we're building towards the publication of the book. And sources seem comfortable in both parties with that. And, and that worked the first time. It worked work just as well this time. Is it time. just a gentleman's agreement? I mean, you guys just promise you're not going to burn them and that's how it works. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, it's, it's not that different from uh, from other promises that we make. You know, <laughs> like when you tell someone something's off the record, right. um, you got to stick by that. If you tell us, you know, you try to be clear with your sources in every conversation, you know, what the terms of the conversation is. And in this case, these are very explicitly book conversations. And, you know, in our magazine work, we say, well, I'm working on a magazine story. And it's just a bit no, no different from the way we normally conduct our business. You guys have both had several experiences in Little Rock before. I want to hear about your first experiences in Little Rock uh, on the record here. What, yeah. Tell me about your first trip to Little Rock. Really, Little Rock and, and Arkansas politics changed my career. There will never be anything I do that will be as, as decisive in, in setting me on a path to get to do all the enjoyable and, and, thing, and fun things I've gotten to do. I came here uh, I just in uh, my mid-20s uh, to cover Bill Clinton for ABC News uh, in 1991. He, he hadn't been in the race that long. and. I traveled to uh, 46 states with him uh, and spent a lot of time in, in Little Rock, mostly at the Capitol Hotel and the Excelsior Hotel. Uh, month after month, uh, he was still governor, obviously. We came back here a ton. And uh, I, I, the restaurants, the people, uh, and the rhythms of Arkansas politics really where I first learned how to cover elections. Were you starstruck? I mean, just being young and a guy with as much charisma you, as Bill Clinton. You know, it's funny because he's the first, he's literally my first beat, not just the first presidential candidate I covered, but I'd never had a full time beat before. And so initially I was struck, and then I thought, well, maybe all the candidates are like this. Maybe there's <laughs> nothing that special about Bill Clinton. Then as I got to sort of experience what other candidates were like in that race and going forward, I realized that I got pretty lucky. First, first, first politician I was ever assigned, assigned to cover full time was really probably the, the best, the best that there there's been at least in my career and in, in, in probably a hundred years. John, I I th I came here I think a couple times in 1992, but the first sustained stretch of time I was here was for the transition, and it, that, that that 90 that the, the very end of 1992 in December 1992. And what I remember most about that was kind of what an extraordinary moment it was. There's not really been a transition quite like that before, or, or that it might not before in my history. Certainly, I was very young as was Mark. Then Mark was already like the mayor of Little Rock by the time um, I spent more than two nights consecutively here. But that transition was nothing like we've not really seen since then either. It was like you know there was a the, because of the fact that people came here and you know there were the the panels that were held and there was a big public element to it. A lot of transitions since then have been conducted much more in a much more kind of uh, on the down low. That was a felt like a big, it felt like a public transition from you know a long stretch of Republican rule. Suddenly there was a Democrat in the White House. It was a period of obviously great economic 
um, crisis in the country, not crisis, but it had been a very bad economy for a period of time. And there was so much energy and so much of the, the there was a, the theatricality to that, to that, uh, to that transition that, that I don't, I don't, can't remember there, maybe there hadn't been one since, like that since Kennedy. Uh, and there hasn't really been one like, one like that since then. And it was all taking place on this kind of strange, not strange, but this, the, the, on, a, on this, this big, big, thea big theater on on this place in a way that I don't even think they had been really during the whole of the campaign because there was so much of the focus of all these big people coming here to try to figure out what was going to happen next. I was not, just to clarify, I was not the mayor of Little Rock, just the mayor. I was the mayor of Juanita's and the deputy mayor of Doe's, but not the mayor of Falls Little Rock. <laughs> well, you guys are both young at that point in time, too, in your, uh, in your journalistic careers, and so you couldn't have even thought about maybe the book that you would have done. You probably wouldn't have had the credibility to pull it off, but how much do you wish you could have written a book about those campaigns with the Clintons back then. Oh, they'd be rich. They'd be rich books. And, <laughs> and you know, the fact is that the Clintons have become such part of the fabric of American life, not just American politics, that uh, a lot of what's happened since has, of course, gotten a lot of coverage, incredible history-making events in the White House. But that campaign was really quite extraordinary, not just because of the emergence of the Clintons on the national stage, but Ross Perot and uh, the Democratic Party picking the Electoral College lock where for several cycles it seemed like they were never going to get the White House back. So I think that race, uh, as good as, as the 2008 race was, I think 1992 give it a run for its money. Yeah, that changed the role of somebody. There was a watershed election in a lot of ways, especially in terms of how the media covered elections and a lot of new, there were a lot of new things happening in 1992. We've often talked about, you know, if we, if, you know, if at some point in our lives we would go back and do you know, historical versions of game change, you know, go back and do, try to do, you know, we're doing these ones that are in real time now, but if we were going to go back and be able to do a game change style book about a presidential election, what would be the one? Or, you know, we, people raise this sometimes, we both always end up saying, you know, 1968 was a huge election. Again, if you think about post-war America, 1968 was a huge, obviously an incredible year in American history, but the, the 1992 election it would give that one a run for its money too, in terms of everything that's happened since then, you can kind of trace back in a variety of ways in terms of polarization of the parties, a lot of the dynamics that were happening in, on, on the electoral front, how campaigning happens, how it works. As I said, the relationship with the media, there's a lot of roots that go back to that 1992 campaign. Maybe in 2016, you can uh, work a Clinton into the narrative on one of the books that you're working on. I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Not impossible. <laughs> Let's talk about some things that are happening in current uh, political real time right now. Let's talk about health care. You guys um, obviously have seen the debacle of what has happened uh, here this fall with the, the healthcare.gov rollout. Any sense when you guys were covering the campaign at the time that, that President Obama was kind of living in these two different worlds of what the political rhetoric was and what the political reality was? But anything that kind of gave you a sense that the moments that we've seen in the last uh, month or so were going to happen back at the time? Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, look, I, I know in, in one sense, I mean, the president really, you know, um, I mean, all presidents are like this in the year that they run for re-election, incumbent president run for re-election, they put policy aside and they're focused on re-election, but this president more than, than most was, you know, was really a full-time candidate for almost all of 2012. And, you know, he, he made this decision, and we were right, we write about this in the book, he made this decision that he couldn't really get anything done with the Republicans in Congress, and that his theory of the case in 2012 was that the only way to make progress on the policy front was he had to win a, win a mandate and sort of crush the Republican spirit, and he, and as he would put it, he was quoted saying, over and over again, I go and break the fever, you know, if we can win and, you know, we'll get this validation for what I've done and a mandate for the future and the Republicans will not have to run against me anymore because I will never be on the ballot again. It hasn't turned out that way. But he was so focused on re-election that I think, you know, the, the amount of time that he, that he was focused on this on the policy stuff was pretty limited. But it's an interesting thing, and Mark will probably talk about this in a second, but, you know, the extent to which health care was a, a much less of an issue in 2012 as a political issue than anybody thought it was going to be. You know, we really expected it to be central to the election, but because of Mitt Romney and his problems with Romney care, mm -hmm. he didn't really aggressively prosecute it in the way that maybe another Republican would have. And then the Supreme Court um, gave the president a kind of vindication that allowed him to really not talk about it very much. So this huge issue that's kind of been overarching for the first four years of the Obama term, and now is the central thing that we're all thinking about and talking about, was really kind of relatively absent compared to other issues in 2012. I think doing health care in a partisan way uh, with only Democratic votes, really sowed, sowed the seeds of where we are now. Uh, when Barack Obama ran for president in 2008, 
he talked about the fact that you couldn't make big social changes without doing it in a bipartisan way, promised that's the way he would govern. There's lots of history there that people have already started to unpack about how much could the president have done it differently, would Republicans have ever been willing to work with him. But I think uh, what you're seeing now is a proud achievement for the president that is not something that Republicans are the least bit invested in, not just in Washington, but around the country. And he's going to have to fight every day of this term to try to keep it on getting implemented smoothly. Very hard in the climate in which we live when things go wrong and no one, no one minimizes what's gone wrong. It's not just a political issue that Republicans are trying to make hay over, but no one can doubt that every step of the way, Republicans with no investment in its success are going to be attacking it. And the campaign only exacerbated that because he did not run a campaign of reconciliation uh, to get reelected. He ran a campaign to demonize Governor Romney and the Republican Party. And we're seeing that play out here in our U.S. Senate race, which is a huge high-profile race. You guys both cover national politics, so you probably understand the stakes of the Mark Pryor-Tom Cotton race as well as anyone. Um, every Tom Cotton ad, every ad uh, that focuses on Mark Pryor focuses on President Obama or President Obama and Obamacare. Um, what's the sense in Washington, D.C., what's the sense in the national beat that you guys follow of how significant this race is, this U.S. Senate race? It may be the biggest race in the country. It's certainly one of the most high-profile. Tons of money will be spent here. You know, Senator Pryor has been a good senator in the sense that nobody's saying he's out of touch. He comes back home a fair amount and obviously got a famous name and, and uh, uh, understands the stakes involved. He's under no illusions about how tough it's going to be. Uh, and um, you've already seen this race get a lot of national focus even this week on with Senator Pryor's new ad and Republicans uh, criticizing it. So I think uh, it, it's, there are a lot of important Senate races. I think this one is going to be as high profile as any, and it's one that without it, Republicans cannot take the majority unless they win this state. And you're going to see both parties uh, here a lot. And, and the, the main issue you raised, we know what Cotton's going to run on. Congressman Cotton's going to run on Barack Obama. And, and try to try to try to merge Senator Pryor and Barack Obama. What is Senator Pryor going to run on? I think that's the big question, not just for him, but for Democrats around the country. How much is he going to have to run against the president? He still defends Obamacare. He still thinks it's good, and, and he points out a lot of people in the state don't have health care. But how much can he sustain defending Obamacare, defending his record, uh, even as he distances himself, which he's already doing somewhat from the president? John, what's your take on this Senate race? Well, it's the same. I, I agree with everything Mark just said, and I just think that you know that's the. It's in. The, you could probably find a lot of templates for 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 what the, all of the Senate races that are in play are going to look so, to some extent like this one. That, that this one is for the reasons Mark said. I think you know it's obviously of great import. But you think about th this is a moment where Republicans are. You know, it's the party is a mess in almost every respect. The Republican Party has not done almost anything in the course of the last 12 months to remediate its problems with the national electorate and put itself in a better position. If you think about it, to, to win in 2016, to think about becoming a national governing party, and yet because of the depth of the problems that the president has had on this one particular issue, really above almost everything else, they have this new opportunity to seize control of the Senate, and so. You're going to see an extraordinary amount of focus on this state and on a handful of others because Republicans really feel like they have the whip hand. They're in this remarkable position of the parties in a state of civil war and, has, as I said, done very little to make itself a more popular party on a national scale and yet is within striking distance of being able to uh, turn this race at the congressional level, especially at the Senate level, into a referendum on Barack Obama and on Obamacare and be able to take a huge prize that would set itself up in theory, conceivably on the path towards being able to have unified control after 2016, if they can get the Senate in 2014, they'll then set up to maybe be in a position of, un, uh, of unfettered control over the whole government if they can somehow pull off 2016.